Alright gamers, welcome to my gin guide for a patch 14.18. In this guide, we're going to cover the early game focused static shift build and the highly underrated scaling focused movement speed crit build. But for now, let's discuss when it is good to pick Jin. In lane, Jin performs best against ADCs who can't force longer trades, since nothing wins short trades against Jin in his fourth shot. He performs poorly against ADCs who can easily force longer trades, such as Twitch, Kai'Sa, and Tristana. Generally, he is also better against the mobile ADCs, since the mobile ones can more easily dodge his ult shots, as well as force onto him. Jin's best supports are mages. His W and ult make him one of the most supportive ADCs, making him very adept at setting up their damage. Additionally, the more damage Jin's support does, the more damage his fourth shot and ult will deal on average, since they will deal extra execute damage based on the damage dealt by his support. Additionally, his ult gives him a way to provide temporary DPS and burst in lane without any need for a frontliner to enable it. He is anywhere from bad to mediocre when paired with both enchanters and engage supports, with no particular preference between the two. It just simply depends on the matchup and his synergy with each individual support. He doesn't like engage supports because he ideally wants to focus on short, bursty trades, not to try to DPS someone to death. And enchanters can be okay, but are just not as good as mages. And just as he performs well with mages, he also performs quite well against them, since he offers more pick potential than the average ADC, which tends to be the weakness of most mages. They're also squishy with no shields, as well as typically very slow moving, making them and their ADC very vulnerable to Jinult, with no great candidate for blocking it. He performs mediocre against enchanters. They keep themselves and their ADC healthy, for taking less damage from 4th shot, and can shield or heal through some of his ult damage. But they are squishy, and don't typically want long trades either, so they're about even matchups. What Jin really detests facing in the support role is tanky engage supports. Most of the time, they can fully tank his ultimate damage for their DC with no worry, and their engages typically force fairly long fights that Jin wants to avoid since fights that lost past his 4th shot and force him to have to reload mid-fight tend to be quite bad for him. For his overall team comp, Jin performs very well with ranged compositions, since he doesn't need to get into basic attack range to have effective follow-up, making him one of the least dependent ADCs on having a solid front line. Ranged champions, particularly mages, tend to be very good with him in all roles. And the same thing also goes for facing enemy comps. His lack of reliance on basic attacks means he is not punished for facing full ranged comps. His W and ult make him very effective at catching out and punishing ranged champions such as mages, making him effective even if he has no frontline to hit. It's also especially valuable for him to have only high priority squishy targets he can hit with his ultimate, with no one able to safely tank his ult shots. Now that we've discussed when you'd ideally want to pick Jin. Let's talk about his build and runes. For runes, regardless of which build you'll end up running, you can run Fleet Footwork, Presence of Mind, Legend Bloodline, Cutdown, Celerity, and Gathering Storm. Although there are some minor changes you can make based on personal preference, this page is good every single game, so if you don't want to overcomplicate things, just run this page every time. If you do want to make changes to it, however, you can swap out Presence of Mind for Triumph, Celerity or Gathering Storm for either Absolute Focus or Nimbus Cloak, or swap out the scaling of a Sorcery Tree altogether for the more early game focused Inspiration, with the options of Magical Footwear, Cashback, Biscuit Delivery, Cosmic Insight, or Jack of All Trades. If you're going to use Triumph over Presence of Mind and also not supplement it with Biscuit Delivery from the Inspiration Tree, you can consider skipping a point in Traps until level 8. Jin traps are influential enough that you should absolutely level them if mana is going to be of little consideration, but when strapped for mana, doing without them greatly spares your mana bar, and putting an extra point in W instead will leave you with an extra 35 damage as well as 0.25 second root duration for the entirety of lane phase, for only 5 extra mana cost compared to 30 mana on every trap usage. When wave clearing, that 35 damage increase alone can add up to 245 damage to a full minion wave, making your non-trap wave clear spike much sooner. That said, mana aside, you are definitely going to be a weaker Jin than if you did level traps. But for Triumph, which is otherwise a great early game rune, it might even be worth it. Meanwhile, when running Jack of All Trades, you shouldn't ever itemize to fully stack it. 
just simply getting to 5 stacks after boots and a dagger will get you the initial 6 AD power spike as well as up to 5 ability haste. And that alone makes Jack of All Trades a very efficient rune in the early game, as well as making Static Shiv's Dagger a much stronger component early on. Just make absolutely sure you're not running Jack of All Trades with Magical Footwear. They're both very strong runes, but running them together and delaying boots means you won't actually get the Jack of All Trades AD spike for quite some time, which defeats the purpose. Jack of All Trades also works well with the scaling crit build. You'll just get the AD power spike upon the purchase of Cloak of Agility rather than Dagger. Moving on to items, the main build is Static Shiv Rush. Static Shiv gives you an insane amount of wave clear combined with your Q bounces, and the amount of poke damage you can stack up for free when both you and the enemy ADC are trying to contest the push is absurd. If they're not contesting the push, then you won't actually get as much value out of it. But in an even lane, Static Shift is easily the difference maker. In high elo, I think the early power you get from it is probably OP because of how important lane prio is and how early on games can be decided there. But in low elo, I think it's more situational and the early power doesn't always translate into the greatest chances of winning. I would recommend it in snowballing matchups where you, don't, where you won't be needed to have high DPS later on or in lanes where both bot lanes want to heavily contest the push such as in range support versus range support matchups. It won't be as important in matchups where either bot lane doesn't want to be contesting the push. After Static Shiv, you'll build Rapid Fire Cannon for its utility. Building a heavily damage focused item isn't too important when you've already heavily handicapped your mid game damage until you have around 4 items. Either way your damage won't be as high as it should be for a gin with that many items, so you'll want to lean into the utility side of things with Fire Cannon giving you extra movement speed on crits and extra range to poke with. Third item, you have the option of either Infinity Edge or Lord Dominic's regards, alternatively swapping LDR for Motor Reminder if anti-heal is needed. Because base armor is so high at this stage, best case scenario if the enemies aren't building armor, Infinity Edge outdamages LDR, but not by much. And worst case scenario if the enemies are building armor, LDR outdamages Infinity Edge and potentially by a lot. So if you want to keep things simple, you can just build LDR third every game, replacing it with a motor reminder as needed. If you don't mind deciding on a case by case basis, you can use Infinity Edge third if the enemies have no armor, and use LDR if they're building armor on two or more champions, even if it's only played at steel caps. Then build whichever you didn't build, and finish off your build with any standard ADC item that you see fit, such as Guardian Angel, Bloodthirster, Collector, Shield Bow, etc. Now we'll move on to the scaling, movement speed focused crit build. First item will be Infinity Edge, which at first item will be a weaker power spike than Static Shiv in most cases. That said, by the 2 item stage, this build will deal noticeably more damage than Static Shiv. And 3 items, the damage and utility difference will be tremendous, due to the amount of movement speed that you'll be gaining on every crit. Your second item is a toss-up between Phantom Dancer or Rapid Fire Cannon. It might sound troll suggesting to build Phantom Dancer instead of Fire Cannon, which is a known staple on Jin, but it is honestly extremely underrated. The 25% attack speed differential results in at least 11 extra AD for Jin by the 2 item point, and the mobility difference is tremendous as well, with Phantom Dancer giving 5% extra movement speed permanently and 10% extra movement speed on crits, for a total of 15% extra movement speed on crits, which makes a massive difference for in combat mobility. In practical terms, when paired with Celerity, Phantom Dancer gives you 17 extra movement speed permanently over Fire Cannon, and a total of 32 extra movement speed on crits. In both cases, that's almost like having a tier 1 and tier 2 boots advantage. It's nuts. That said, I don't think Phantom Dancer is necessarily better than Fire Cannon. Overall, they both bring amazing benefits to him, and I would say to use whichever you want, they can be situational, uh, or also just personal preference. Personally, I just tend to gravitate towards Phantom Dancer, because I find it more fun. But the real magic happens when you pair them both together. Coupled with Celerity, when you have Infinity Edge and both ZL items, you'll be running at, uh, at 580 movement speed on every crit, which at 75% crit chance will be quite often. And you achieve this fairly early on into the game as well, because zeal items are absurdly cheap this season. Both costing only 2600 gold for a very three, very fast 3 item power spike. 
By this point, melee champions have an incredibly hard time either closing the gap onto you or keeping up with you once they have. Since it's no exaggeration to say that you are by far the most mobile ADC or even perhaps champion in the game at this stage. The benefits don't just end up more effective kiting either. Many ranged champions will also struggle to deal damage to you because you're almost impossible to hit skill shots on with so much movement speed. You'll be able to auto attack a minion, zoom right into their face and melt them while dodging everything they try and put out to fight back or CC you. Your damage doesn't fall off either with this build contrary to what you might expect. With a static shiv build using infinity edge at third item, you would have around 431 AD by level 13. But with Infinity Edge and the two Zeal items, you still end up having 360 AD, despite only building one AD item. Which, paired with 25% extra crit chance, is going to yield very similar damage in raw DPS tests, at the cost of less damage on your abilities. And your fourth shot. And what DPS tests don't even account for is the Zeri effect. You have so much movement speed that your ability to get in range to deal damage, as well as your ability to be in range to deal damage without dying for it, is going to be insanely high compared to other builds and ADCs. On paper, the damage may just be similar, but in practice, this build will deal far more damage and die less while doing so. The only cost is the one is the weaker one item power spike. Another advantage of this build over the Static Shift build is also its flexibility. You're not forced to do the double zeal item build path. If by third item you notice the enemies are stacking lots of armor or are just very tanky, you can just do Lord Dominic's regards or Motor Reminder as necessary. And delay one of the zeal items until fourth item. That way you'll have both Infinity Edge and LDR to melt whomever necessary, while the Static Shift build would be forced to skip one of either Infinity Edge or Lord Dominic's regards, which would lead to absurdly less damage. With the crit build, you have the liberty of only building the Mosquito items when you can get away with it, and just not building them when you can't. As for boots, for both builds you'll always want Boots of Swiftness. A lot of people like to use Berserker's Greaves on the attack speed builds, but there's just no need to stack attack speed from literally every source possible. In fact, Swifties are even more important on the attack speed build than on regular gen builds, because when you get slowed, you are losing a lot more movement speed than you do on regular builds, since you have more movement speed to lose. This means the slow resistance is a lot more effective than it is on regular gen builds. And because you're building less AD than regular gen builds, the AD amplification from Berserker's attack speed is actually less effective, not more. For the Static Shiv build, I would recommend delaying Swifties until after your first item, so you can rush Shiv as early as possible to abuse its power spike in lane. For Infinity Edge, which doesn't achieve its full potential until you have more crit items, delaying the power spike is fine, and you can build Swifties whenever convenient. They perform great on Jin in lane, since having a great movement speed advantage over the enemy allows you to easily hit your fourth shot. Moving on from the build, I'm going to talk in depth about some of the most important tips and tricks you need to know in order to succeed with Jin. Because your fourth shot is an execute that does more damage to lower HP targets, you generally want to lead with Q, then fourth shot rather than the other way around. However, this is only for when you want to maximize your damage, and sometimes there are other considerations. For example, if you don't know for sure whether you'll have time to land both hits before an enemy exits your range, you'll want to lead with the one that does the most damage, which is 4th shot. Then you can see if you can land the Q, and if you can't, then it's no big deal. But leading with the Q, and then finding you're no longer in range to hit 4th shot, is quite the loss, so it's a scenario you'll want to avoid as much as possible. Speaking of 4th shot, it's also good to note that it is completely uncancelable. This means that you can right-click a target and then flash away the next millisecond, and the shot will still go through. You can use this to your advantage to flash skill shots while still dealing damage, or to trade final blows with the enemy ADC and flash their auto while they still die to yours. When an enemy is near your minions to lost hit slash trade, you can bounce Q on low HP minions for more damage. You can even deliberately set up their HP bars to be low enough that they'll all die. But you can look to do this even if there's only one minion you can kill as long as you're sure it'll bounce onto the enemy and not onto the wave. A minion still counts as dying, even if it dies after the bounce. 
This means if you do Q, then auto attack the minion to finish it off, the damage will still increase. This increase happens even if the Q has already bounced onto the next target. For example, you can throw the Q onto the first minion, bounce it onto the second with no damage increase, then have your auto attack land and kill the first minion, and the damage increase will go through for the third and fourth hits. Your fourth shot by default times out and forces you to reload after 10 seconds. However, this timer is reset every time you cast an ability, so if you really want to hold on to your fourth shot to threaten or find an opportunity to poke with it, you can just keep casting your E or W to keep it going. You can also rely on your Q to loss at minions during this time, which will also reset the fourth shot timer on cost. Having fourth shot available means your burst is at its maximum potential, but your DPS is at its lowest, as your next auto after the fourth shot would force you to reload. It's fine to hold it for trading or finishing someone off, but if your goal is to DPS a tank or someone who has full HP in lane, you'll actively want to get rid of the fourth shot, since your DPS is at its highest when you have all four bullets available. You also need to be careful about giving the opponents opportunities to engage on you while you only have one or two bullets, as you'll essentially be getting caught with your pants down if they're not already low HP. In essence, don't overemphasize holding your fourth shot, as it can sometimes be detrimental. On Jin, it is tremendously important to think about how many bullets you need for any given task. For the same situation, it can both be true that one bullet is too few, and four bullets is too many. For example, sometimes auto Q fourth shot can be the perfect amount of HP to execute someone from, meaning that two bullets is the perfect amount to approach a fight with. If you have three, the opponent is still going to die only when they get, when they get hit by the fourth shot, it's just going to take you one auto more for absolutely no reason. So be deliberate about what amount of bullets you enter a fight with, and also don't forget to consider summoners like barrier and heal in your calculations. What HP thresholds require what amount of bullets is very dependent on items and levels, so you're going to have to rely on experience to determine that. Unlike other DCs who can spam auto attacks on whoever's in their range, Jin has to be very careful and deliberate about who he chooses to use his bullets on. For example, if your support engages on the enemy ADC and you're too far away to immediately follow up, but you know the goal is to kill that ADC, the only reason to hit the enemy support while walking to the ADC is if you're trying to set up the perfect amount of bullets discussed in the previous tip. If you need two bullets and you already have two, do not waste one on the support. Just ignore them as much as it may feel you shouldn't. If you need three and you have four, feel free to hit them. Somewhat related to the previous tip, don't use Q if it's not going to make a difference. For example, if the enemy is going to die to auto then fourth shot, don't bother going auto then Q then fourth shot. Not only are you wasting the mana and cooldown, but you're also self CCing yourself to cast an obsolete source of damage. These drawbacks might end up negatively impacting you, or they might not. But save yourself the risk and just learn to hold yourself back from using it if it won't actually be needed. Often it can be worth it to hold your bullets, especially 4th shot, through enemy shields such as barrier. For example, if an ADC is going to die to your 4th shot, but wouldn't die to a regular bullet, and then they pop barrier, the barrier will tank their 4th shot so they'll survive it for that auto. And then your next auto after the reload will be a regular auto, so they'll survive that too. If you know you need your 4th shot to kill someone who receives a shield, consider just not hitting them until the shield times out. This can be true on two bullets as well. Someone can be about to die to your next two autos, but then receive a shield, but then block the damage from the first auto, which then makes the fourth shot deal less damage too, meaning you have to wait through the reload for at least one more auto, which also may not kill them if you're unlucky. Unlike other ADCs, you should be thinking of your autos as an expendable resource. Reaching zero is sometimes okay, but it can sometimes cost you fights so you don't want to waste essential bullets on shields that would have timed out soon anyway. W's long cost time means it's great to use it when you're about to get CC'd, as you'll spend the whole CC costing an ability rather than being properly stunned. This is way more efficient than getting CC'd and then also later self CCing yourself with your ability cost. A nice trick to catch enemies off guard with W roots is to bounce Q on a wave in a way that it'll hit the opponent and then throw a W before the Q is landed. Enemies are generally only primed to dodge your W when they are marked and on the lookout, 
So if you can get the mark to apply while your W is already about to land, there will usually be no response from the enemy who is not looking out for a potential root yet. You can also execute this trick off of your own ally's damage instead of your Q. If you can see one of your allies is about to damage an enemy champion, start casting W before the damage is even landed. The enemy won't be worried about a root when they're not already marked and will be late to start dodging it. When enemies are shoving a wave under turret and you know they'll want to dive you, you can place two traps one after the other to both slow and damage different sections of the wave, then follow it up with W and Q. This will wipe out most of the wave, giving you most of the lost hits and leaving you safe from getting dived. When using your ult, bear in mind that each shot has a travel time. This means it's easier to hit opponents from mid-range than long-range, and easier for them to react and to dodge the bullets the further away that they are. Keep this in mind when choosing which targets to focus during your ult, and also when considering whether it's worth ulting and what range to cast it from. Depending on how close or far they are, and also how many points you have in W, hitting a root on an enemy with W will often guarantee that the first shot of your ult will always land if you cast it immediately after W. This is an especially good way to start your ult, because if the opponent is close enough, the slow from one shot almost guarantees the next shot, meaning the initial W hit can possibly lead to a full chain of successful ult hits. One of the greatest uses for your ult in lane is to finish off fights once disengaged. Say you're on the losing end of a fight and retreating into your turret, where the enemies can no longer chase you. Now you have a chance to use your ult and kill the enemies. If they're low at all, like at least below half HP, it's very likely you'll kill at least one, or force the other one to tank all the shots and lose all their HP to save their lane partner. It is a huge risk for enemies to engage a fight on Jin and not outright kill him, since once the fight is over he can just open his ult and they won't have time to exit its range. That's why you must remember that any trade that doesn't result in kills is always worth it for you as Jin, since you can finish off opponents from out of their range, while they can't do the same to you. If the enemies fight you, they absolutely need you to die in the process or it may well end up backfiring even if the fight initially seemed good for them. For teamfights, ult doesn't just have to be used to clean up, it can be used to immediately follow up your team if you're not already in range to begin auto attacking. If an engage happens and walking into range would take a few seconds, just open up ult instead, as the DPS you get from hitting all the bullets is quite decent, and even if you miss, you're forcing the enemy to focus on sidestepping instead of teamfighting. Hitting the 4th bullet on a champion is always a crit and will reward you with movement speed, so the process of moving towards the fight will usually be faster if you do it after ulting rather than before. And that just about brings us to the end of everything I had prepared for you in this guide. If you found this content helpful, make sure to like and subscribe for more educational ADC content and let me know if you'd like to see more guides like this for more ADCs. In the meantime, if you want to see all these gen tips being put into action, make sure to click the video on your screen.